Good afternoon and welcome back. My name is Emily Chapui and I'm the Deputy General Counsel at the Copyright Office. We are continuing the Section 1201 rulemaking hearings. This is the final day of the hearings and the final class on which we are hearing testimony. This is Class 7, Computer Programs Vehicle Operational Data. And a few reminders before we get started. These should be familiar to you all that have been tuning in. The goal of today's hearing is to focus on legal and factual issues that could benefit from additional development or clarification. In this section, my colleagues will ask specific questions and call on participants to respond. Please use your raise hand function on Zoom to indicate that you'd like to speak. This hearing is being live streamed. It's also being recorded and transcribed by a court reporter. The video and transcript will be po posted to the Copyright Office website after the hearings conclude. We ask that everyone uh, speak loudly and clearly and please mute your microphone anytime you're not speaking. Finally, for those of you who are listening in, um, we do have a public participation session immediately following this session uh, beginning at four o'clock. And um, I, believe that you can still sign up uh, to participate. You should do so very quickly at this point. Um, and we'll hear from, from uh, the public on issues that they wanna raise based on the previous hearings. We'll now turn to class seven and uh, let's begin the introductions with the Copyright Office. Melinda. Hi, my name is Melinda Kern and I am an attorney advisor with the Copyright Office. Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Gray. I'm an assistant general counsel here in the Copyright Office's Office of General Counsel. Okay. And Isaac? Hello, my name is Isaac Klipstein. I'm the Ringer Fellow. Great. Uh, we also have one of our colleagues from NTIA here. Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Cheney. I'm a senior attorney advisor in the Office of Chief Counsel at NTIA. Good to be with you. Thanks, Stacey. Um, and let's do introductions for our participants now, beginning with the proponents of the exemption. Uh, so let's begin with Auto Care Association. Hi, I'm Lisa Fauche. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the Auto Care Association. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Seth Greenstein. I'm with the law firm of Constantine Cannon, and I'm outside counsel to Auto Care. And Mima. I'm Dan Jasnow. I'm a partner at Fox Schiff, and we are here representing Mima, the Vehicle Suppliers Association. Great. And I fix it. I'm Kyle Weens, the CEO of I Fix It, uh, representing the eight million fixers, fixing everything from cell phones to cars on I Fix It. Uh, and the opponents, uh, the joint creators. Good afternoon. I'm Steve England of uh, Jenner and Block, uh, representing the Entertainment Software Association, the Motion Picture Association, and the Recording Industry Association of America. Great. Thank you. And Auto Innovators. Hi, I'm Mark Humphrey. I'm a partner at Mitchell Silverberg and Nuff, and I'm outside counsel to the Alliance for Automotive Innovation or Auto Innovators. Okay. Did I get everyone? Great. Then I will turn it over to Melinda to begin the questions. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so just as a general roadmap for everyone, um, we're going to start with scope, uh, meaning scope of the exemption, move on to non-infringing uses, uh, carve outs, TPMs, and then adverse effects generally. But I would like to propose my first question to the proponents. So the comments discuss both telematics data and vehicle operational data, but neither is defined. What specific types of data or different types of data does this proposed exemption cover? The proposed class here pertains to vehicle operational data, but we're wondering also whether there is a definition for that as well. Thank you. And if you could please use a hand, raise hand function too, um, let me know. All right, Mr. Jass now. Yes, thank you. So I'm happy to address that that question, and and I just want to say thank you to the Copyright Office for organizing this and for giving MEMA as well as the other proponents a chance to address your questions today. Um, so with respect to operational data, I would say it falls into um, a couple different subcategories, but primarily what we're talking about 
is data that is generated uh, pursuant to a vehicle owner or lessee's use of the vehicle. So our position is that that data, that raw data is very unlikely to be protectable under copyright, but we acknowledge that it might be embedded within or we might need access to uh, copyrightable, copyrighted software or copyrighted database schema in order to access either the raw or the somewhat organized data. And the subcategories of that would be things like vehicle performance data, which might be information about a vehicle's speed, acceleration, braking, fuel consumption, engine performance. It might relate to vehicle status data, which might be uh, something like uh, information about uh, whether the vehicle's in motion, its current location, status of various vehicle systems like the engine or the brakes. It might pertain to driver behavior data, such as driving style, aggressiveness, cautiousness, um, and it might pertain to environmental data, such as the road conditions or other environmental conditions that uh, the vehicle is being operated in. Telematics data, we, you know, overlaps to some degree, but it is data that is being uh, conveyed from the vehicle to some remote cloud um, application or system. So anything that is potentially traveling between the vehicle um, and a third party cloud or, or server. Mr. Weens? I would concur with what he just said. I would also include maintenance data, information on uh, tire pressure sensors, uh, what's the what's the uh, list of codes the car has thrown? Which ones have been reset? There's a whole wealth of, of service data that's also useful. You can also think of information that you might want in a fleet management context. Uh, a lot of that is telematic data that can be sent to a fleet cloud. You might want, want it to aggregate service information as an owner. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more hands. Um, so I will ask just a, another follow up question. Um, is the primary difference between the diagnosis of repair and the repose, proposed, I'm sorry, proposed exemption erasing the purpose requirement? Mr. Jasno. And if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, please let me know. No, oh, that's correct. Um, so the what I would say is that the uh, the current ex proposed exemption, the class seven exemption uh, is a little bit beyond the scope of the existing exemption for diagnosis, repair or modification of the vehicle. So what we are envis envisioning is a situation where a vehicle owner or lessee or a independent re repair facility acting on their behalf is is getting access to their own data about the performance and operation of the vehicle for things that go beyond the the strict scope of repair and we we talked about some of these things in our written submissions but this might include for example um uh taking steps to uh um uh, decrease costs and improve the efficiency of the vehicle owners or lessees experience uh, through the repair process. So for example, if, if a vehicle owner or lessee wanted to share or share performance information about their vehicle with their preferred uh, independent repair shop or an insurance company, for example, in a manner that would allow the insurance company or the repair shop to um, you know, be able to identify when a particular repair part is going to be needed, what particular repair part is going to be need uh, is going to be needed at a particular time, um, uh, issues that might uh, affect the timing of an oil change, the the you know environmental factors that might affect the timing of an oil change, when something might be necessary, temperatures, uh, tire pressure, any of those things. So that by providing that information by me as my vehicle owner, being able to provide that to a third party who can offer me services, then potentially reduce the amount of time that a vehicle is in the shop. 
uh, reduce the amount of time that a family is without a car because the car is in the garage. Uh, you know, reduce the cost of repairs because you're able to check things, um, you know, beforehand, or you're able to prevent it from getting to a worse position than it might otherwise if you're not regularly uh, reporting information about the performance of the vehicle to an aftermarket specialist. Uh, and in the insurance context, you know, it's things like partially what we've already seen, but where an insurance company might be able to get access to some of the vehicle operational data, performance data, and say, you know, you've been, you've been uh, a really safe driver, we're going to offer you a better rate. And then of course, there's the example that we provided where, you know, maybe it's not repair at all, but you want to be able to um, monitor the, the, you know, your new family, the new driver in your family, the 16 year old who's taking the car out. Um, yes, there might be third party software options that are available to provide some of that. But we don't really think that's, you know, what the owner of the vehicle should have to rely on in order to, um, you know, avoid liability under the DMCA's anti anti circumvention provisions. So it's any of those things. It's it's related for sure to the repair, but it but it goes beyond uh, the scope of what we've what the copyright office has already um, approved. Thank you, Mr. England. So when I first took a look at this uh, proposal, uh, uh, my question was uh, uh, very similar to yours. Which, what, what is this uh, proposal trying to do uh, beyond what the existing uh, Exemption 13 does? And uh, uh, for uh, 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 searched the comments and uh, uh, found that the comments are focused on repair. So for example, the DOJ FTC comments talk about having more options for repair. Uh, the MEMA reply comments talk about repair costs uh, and streamlining of repair. Uh, and in the first uh, seven-eighths of uh, Mr. Jasna's comments a moment ago, it was all about repair. So uh, I, I'm still kind of searching for uh, uh, what the purpose here is that that, that isn't repair, despite uh, Mr. Jasna's comments a moment ago, although he did uh, uh, finally suggest at uh, the end of his remarks uh, parents uh, check, checking their kids driving. And so maybe that's something that we could talk about as a purpose for this uh, exemption. But uh, uh, at the moment, uh, it seems like there's just uh, very little justification for having an additional exemption that is 95% about repair. Thank you, Mr. Humphrey. I would just concur uh, with what Mr. England just said. My first thought upon seeing this was um, being struck by the lack of specific um, justification. Uh, you know, the NPRM specifically says that these concerns can't be hypothetical. They can't be, um, they, they have to be based in some kind of uh, evidentiary fact. And I haven't seen really anything. I've seen a lot of theories on what could happen, uh, statements about things that are happening, but uh, you know, I don't see anything from a specific person who has actually had these difficulties. Now, uh, you know, if we do want to talk about a specific purpose, like Mr. Anglin just said, I think that's fine. But the definition as it currently is, in auto innovators' view, is extremely broad. Um, as we said in our comments, the definition of vehicle operational data could potentially cover data that relates to the vehicle's technical operation and performance unrelated to a specific driver, which could potentially be uh, protected as a trade secret. Thank you. Um, I will pass it to my colleague, um, Isaac, Mr. Jasno. I do see your hand up, but I think Isaac does have a question uh, towards you. So hopefully you can pull it in your response. Yes, this is thematically quite similar. Uh, a lot of the discussion so far has been about the uses of data, and we were wondering whether the data itself might be different for these non-diagnostic and repair uses. Mr. Jasmine. Yeah, so certainly I think some of the data would be different, and, and the operational data is what I would focus on in that context. We're talking about uh, data that relates specifically to the operation of the vehicle, so things like speed, um, acceleration, uh, status of various systems, you know, there is for sure overlap in some of these categories, but, um, you know, what we think that it's important to focus on is that this is all 
in, this is all data that is generated by the performance, by the operation of the vehicle by the owner or lessee, right? So, so the, the OEMs have no claim uh, to rights in that data. It's, it's not data that existed in the vehicle at the time the vehicle left the lot. It's not data that was or is included in any copyright application filed by the OEMs. Um, you know, with respect to the joint creators, the repair exemption already excludes, you know, circumvention in order to gain access to any vehicle entertainment or media systems. We're totally happy with that kind of exclusion. Again, we don't see no reason um, for that. But, you know, the data here that we're talking about is very clearly, number one, not uh, most likely not protectable in its raw form. And number two, it, it's, you know, there's a very strong basis for the owner or lessee of the vehicle to claim ownership over that data. And it's data that relates to how that owner or lessee is operating their vehicle. Um, you know, the, the opponents have talked about, we haven't provided, you know, sufficient justification for why we should need this. I would turn that around and say, what justification are they providing for claiming that it should be behind a um, perpetual um, lockbox? Uh, this is, I think, gets really to the heart of what these rulemaking proceedings are for, which is that we should not be using uh, the anti-circumvention provisions as a way to lock up information about uh, a vehicle owner or lessee's own um, data that is derived from their use of the vehicle, particularly when we are seeing an exponential growth in the amount of data that's being generated by these vehicles and the sophistication of the onboard um, control units, um, you know, a complete transformation from a situation where a DIYer could come in and really understand what was going on with their vehicle to a situation where, you know, that information is increasingly unobtainable, uh, particularly unobtainable without threat of liability under the DMCA. Thank you. Mr. Weins, you put your hand down. I'll defer to Lisa first and then maybe I'm done. We'll go to Ms. Fouché. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to add one point. It, it is, um, it, as everyone on this call knows, the set of repair and diagnostic codes are a defined set, a defined language that communicates operational issues with the vehicles. What the exemption does, as Dan has articulated, is broadens that and puts context around it so that the owner of the vehicle can understand not only the particular diagnostic or repair code, but how that fits into the usage of the vehicle as they themselves are driving it or using it. And so it protects the owner of the vehicle who wants to understand the whole picture, if you will, as opposed to just pulling a specific code off of the vehicle. Thank you. Mr. Ains. So the last time that I rented the car from Hertz, uh, you go into the, the, the sound system and it had the contacts of the previous person who had synced their, blue, their phone via Bluetooth that had all their contacts in there. Uh, and, and a large part of what we've done over the years with iFix is help uh, folks who are refurbishing and reselling products wipe data in the process of selling products. So imagine you're selling a used car. What's the data on the car? I bought the car. I want to wipe the previous owner's data completely off the car before I sell it to the next person so I don't have data leakage. Uh, we call, sell, help companies that sell copy machines. They sell used copy machines. Copy machines have a hard drive in them that has like all the previous 10,000 pages that you photocopied. Uh, it's very bad if that information is still on it when you resell the product. So for, uh, there's many reasons why an owner might want to be able to inspect and see the data that's on there. If it's got driving record of the last 10,000 miles, uh, if I'm reselling a product, I'd want to be able to wipe that. And that I, uh, on I fix it, we've done this with cell phones over the years. We've had hundreds of individual wipe instructions. That's very model specific where we have to help people get in and remove the data from a cell phone before it gets sold to the next person. So we, we should be able to do the same thing for cars. Mr. Greenstein. Thank you. So I think what you're hearing is that there's really uh, kind of a Venn diagram here between the proposed exemption and the old exemption. The Certainly some of the data that is pertinent to the new exemption would include things that are sent by telematics that would be directly relevant to 
fixing a particular problem with the vehicle. However, there's also a lot of data that you're hearing about that is personal data, as Kyle was just explaining, or data regarding driving habits that might have some implications in the future for use. It might have some implications for safety. It might be of interest, as uh, as Dan pointed out to, you know, or as, as Kyle pointed out, to the owner of a fleet or to a parent or to an insurance company. But importantly, as Kyle and Dan were pointing out, this is information and data that's owned by the consumer. And there really isn't a lot of justification here for a third party, even the vehicle manufacturer, to use technological means to lock it up and make it inaccessible to the owner of the data or to those who the owner of the data would like to have access to it for uh, promoting their own purposes. Mr. England? Now, Mr. Jasno mentioned the uh, joint creators and uh, the current exemption language about uh, uh, obtaining access to other copyrighted works. And while it's not specifically relevant to uh, the office's question, I'd like to simply underscore that since it's probably the most important issue from my client's perspective that uh, uh, currently the exemption 13 has two aspects that are important for the protection of creative works. Uh, the uh, limitation that uh, circumvention not be accomplished for purposes of gaining access to other copyrighted works and also uh, uh, carve out for separate subscription services. And I uh, think that uh, the proponents have uh, uh, to varying degrees accepted both of those. And so I hope that keeping them is not controversial, but uh, 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 it is the request of the joint creators that uh, if the office decides that there is a need for another exemption, that uh, that language, both pieces should be included. And Mr. Humphrey? I wanted to be uh, clear about one thing first, just so that there's no confusion. Um, auto innovators do not oppose the um, uh, renewal of the existing exemption. The issue is with this proposed exemption. And one thing that I think has been overlooked, both in most of the comments and uh, so far today, is the fact the auto industry has taken great steps to make this kind of data available through the Memorandum of Understanding uh, from 2014 and the data sharing commitment uh, that was entered into just last year. Um, and these agreements give access to a lot of the data that we're discussing. In particular, the data sharing commitment provides access to telematics data that is provided to dealers. Um, independent repair facilities are able to obtain that data through multiple means. Uh, there are websites, for example, that functions as repositories for diagnostics data and provide the most up-to-date information available by the auto manufacturers. There are aftermarket scan tools that will allow third-party companies uh, to buy those. Uh, they can provide remote diagnostic support for independent businesses. That could alleviate the concern about the inefficiency of repair to the extent that's even um, something that we should be considering today. Uh, and that could eliminate the need to send the vehicle out to a dealer. And uh, I would point out <clears throat> that uh, one of the comments filed was by uh, a joint a joint filing by the FTC and the DOJ, and they actually uh, spoke glowingly of the auto industry as uh, a standard to aspire to uh, because of the lengths that the, the industry has gone to to provide this kind of data to consumers um, and enable people to repair vehicles. Thank you. And I think last on this question for now, I'll go to Ms. Fouché. Thank you. I just, um, if appropriate, wanted to respond to Mr. Humphrey on the MOU and the and the data sharing agreement. Um, you know, it's obviously a topic that, that his organization and mine have debated fairly extensively over the last year. But in terms of the 2014 MOU and the, um, what we call the ASA Pact or the data sharing agreement, there are multiple reasons that were articulated in MEMA's comments, and I'll reiterate here as to why those are not sufficient, either for the independent aftermarket or for consumers going forward, not the least of which is that they are voluntary, they are non-binding, there's no enforcement mechanism, they don't cover many of the types of vehicles that are covered by this exemption, or in fact, all of the automakers. And the 2014 MOU exempts telematics data. The ASA PAC or the data sharing agreement tries to window dress the inclusion of telematics, but it only includes telematics data that is 
not otherwise available via the OBD2 port in the car. So you would, in essence, keep the consumers and the aftermarket in sort of a wireline technology world where you have to have the car in the garage and plug it in, whereas the manufacturers and their dealerships could move into this wireless diagnosis world, um, which is obviously where consumers would like to end up. Um, in addition, the, the, there was testimony about this in front of the um, Energy and Commerce Subcommittee that the ASA is in large part funded by the OEs. Um, as it states on their website, they're, most of the OEs are members of ASA, so it's really sort of in agreement with themselves. ASA represents less than 2% of the independent shops in the United States. Um, so, you know, the folks in in our membership in our industry and MEMAs, we don't view this as a viable solution going forward. Um, and it really comes back to a fundamental question of if, if everyone is comfortable making all of this operational data and all of this repair data available via telematics and via OBD2, then let's just um, you know, have this exception, this exemption, and let's just codify that and we can all move forward. Um, you know, but that's not been a solution that, that has been workable for them thus far. So I just wanted to make those points about, about the so-called agreements. Thank you. I'd like to invite my colleague from NTIA to ask a, a follow-up on this. Uh, and Mr. Humphrey, I see your hand raised we are going to try to get through our questions a little bit more quickly. So if you could save your comment, uh, but uh, Mr. No. Chain. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Isaac. Uh, and I appreciate the conversation so far um, around the agreement stuff. I wanted to back up just a touch here because there seems to be some, I think, confusion as we try to look at an, a potential overlap between these two exemptions, the proposed one and the old one. It, just a question, and maybe Mr. Weens can help us here a little bit. When you uh, go through the process uh, using the first exemption and exemption 13 that currently exists, and you gain access to the computer systems, is it the same process that you would use to gain access to the telematics? In other words, once you've done it under 13, wouldn't you also then have access to the information that's there? And so really using the same exempt, uh, one exemption for access to both. Does that help? The, the, yes, uh, it's a good question. It kind of depends on the vehicle. <laughs> so in some cases, yes, your your point is valid, but, but I don't think that's the case across all of them. Sometimes they're separate systems. Uh, and I guess just to follow up with that is, does the first exemption allow us access to that telematics data um, already? Meaning somebody were to go through that process in the first one, wouldn't they be able to access that telematics or other diagnostic data already? Yeah, I don't have firsthand experience doing this recently, so I, I, I think we could probably look at that and get back to you. Mr. English. I'll just point out that uh, a moment ago, Mr. Weens referred to different systems, but I think that that's not a distinction that is made in the regulations. I look at the proposed regulatory language and uh, both existing exemption 13 and the new proposed exemption both apply to software that controls vehicles. So I think it's the same software we're talking about. Uh, uh, not any limitation I can find in exemption 13 that says some systems and not others. So uh, again, it looks like uh, they are substantially overlapping to me. Not sure who is next. Ms. Fossey, I think you show up first online. Um, sure. I just wanted to, and, and I apologize if I misunderstood your question that you were asking, Kyle, but th with respect to access to telematics data, um, today the aftermarket, automotive aftermarket does not have access to wirelessly transmitted data to vehicles. Um, you know, um, Tesla is the easiest walk around example, um, but in all but in all cases, this data is being transmitted wirelessly from the vehicles to the manufacturer servers. You know, sort of terabytes of data, and um, 
the aftermarket does not access that in either operational data or repair maintenance data. I, I think just to clarify the question, if I could, is once you've done gone through the um, decryption under the first one, under the first exemption that exists now, would you get gain access to that telematics without having to have a different exemption? In other words, going through the process of that current exemption, does it get, allow you to gain access to that uh, data already? So Seth, you jump in here if I'm not understanding the question correctly, but I, I believe the answer to that is that because we don't access it telematically in the aftermarket or consumers can't access it, we haven't done it under the old exemption and we couldn't yet do it under the new exemption. Um, but I think the issue is that if you had the capability to access it via that transmission method, then you would be accessing it, um, you would be accessing different data sets. That goes back to the Venn diagram. And if I can just jump in here really quickly, uh, I think not having the exemption potentially creates a perverse incentive to make them different systems if they're not already different. Uh, and so to the extent that you know, the exemption would cover access to all of the data for these various lawful purposes, then uh, it would guarantee that regardless of how it was protected, by what kind of technological protection measure, whether it was the same one or whether different ones, consumers and their authorized repair facilities and others would still have lawful access. And Thank you. Mr. Chesson, just to add can I just really quickly remind yeah, yeah. the right. panelists to please use the hand raise function? Thank you. Mr. Chestnut. So, you know, I, I think the most critical point is that even if you can access that same data, consumers are currently restricted by the limited nature of the permit, permissible uses under the existing exemption. So the existing exemption allows for circumvention for the purposes of uh, diagnosis, repair, or lawful modification of the vehicle. Here, uh, we have identified you know, additional uses that we think that are lawful, that are um, uh, essentially just allowing consumers to use their own data about their the way that they've operated the vehicle for purposes such as uh, sharing information um, with an insurer or repair technician or, or dealership uh, to uh, reduce the amount of time that a vehicle might be in the shop to learn about the driving habits of a new driver um, to get a discount on insurance. These are these are uh, uses that are um, you know we think very reasonable. There shouldn't be a reason that a consumer shouldn't be able to access the data for this purposes. It is their own data. It's not subject to copyright protection. All we are asking for is um, to be able to circumvent and access some portion of copyrighted software, with, whether that's the database schema, some organized components of the database that might be protectable in order to access the consumer's own data for these broader purposes that are not within the scope of the current exemption. In the interest of time, I'm going to pass this to my colleague, Mark Gray. Uh, thank you very much, Isaac. Um, and yes, Mr. Humphrey, I'm I'm sorry a second time <laughs> to, to skip you. Um, as a quick reminder for you and for the other panelists today, um, obviously we started a few minutes late because of technical difficulties. Um, we are scheduled to end at 3.45, though we can go a few minutes over. Um, we do need to stop before the four o'clock audience participation section. Um, so in general, I, I would encourage people to try to limit responses to responses to responses to only a few, just so that we can get through a, a long list of questions. Um, I, I know people have a lot to say. Um, as Melinda mentioned at the outset, we're gonna go through non-infringing uses, adverse effects, TPMs. I'm sure there will be opportunities to share your thoughts in the context of those questions. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one quick question and then one a little bit more in depth. Uh, the first question is for the proponents. Um, there was some discussion in the comments, I think particularly sort of in the opposition and the reply about the definition of telematics. Um, I, if I recall, one of the oppositions mentioned that in the 2015 cycle, nine years ago, the discussion of telematics was really more focused on geolocation data and GPS data. It sounds like from the discussion we've had so far, that is not 
what the intended scope of the telematics definition is in the proposed exemption. Um, maybe uh, Kyle or someone else, can you confirm that whether that's the case? I'll defer to some of the other folks. Happy to take that unless Lisa, you want to jump in? No, Dan, why don't you do it? And I can jump in if there's something else. Thank you. Um, I do think that the telematics data goes, you know, beyond simply the geolocation data. And, and this is a reflection of the fact that, you know, especially since 2015, you know, the amount of data that is being collected and transmitted uh, wirelessly from these vehicles has increased exponentially and will likely continue to increase exponentially. Um, um, we certainly would be open just as we're open to uh, a limitation on access to enter third party uh, intellectual property or subscription services. You know, I think if there are concerns about um, access to telematics data uh, that are related to safety or regulatory compliance, that's something that the Copyright Office has, you know, very effectively handled in the past, uh, whether that's a um, temporary delay in the implementation of a new exemption to allow comments from, you know, NHTSA or, or other regulators, the EPA, um, or, you know, uh, expressly prohibiting any access to telematics data that might implicate uh, or for purposes of circumventing uh, vehicle safety or environmental compliance regulations. Certainly that's, that would be something that I, I think MEMA would not oppose. We would welcome, we've, we've already stated that in some of our comments, um, but yes, it, it does, the telematics data does go beyond the scope of just geolocation information and it might include other things as well. Great, uh, thank you. That's a very helpful clarification. Uh, my next question is, um, in the proposed uh, exemption language, the, I believe the phrase you, you used was uh, access, store, and share data. Um, in the last cycle, we had an exemption that was focused on extracting data from medical devices. And in the context of that, that was very clearly sort of an access, essentially reading the data, but not modifying any of the data embedded on the device. Um, earlier today, Mr. Weens talked about an example of modifying or deleting data, maybe data from a, a previous user or consumer. Um, what are the how do you envision the scope of this? Is this simply reading data? Is this modifying data that exists on the vehicle? What are the intended use cases with respect to those other, I guess, verbs? Uh, Ms. Fiche. I think it, it could be all three. You have to read the data to know what's wrong with the car and you have to send commands. In the case of repair, you have to send a command back to the car. So in a very simplistic example, if, if um, the car tells you that its tire is flat, you have to change the tire and then you have to send a command back to the car to say, um, to tell the ECU that you've put a new tire on the car and that they should accept that. So it's not modifying the underlying operational software of the car, but it is talking to the car and saying, please update tire from tire A to tire B. So that's helpful, but given that we have a current exemption in the books that allows for repair and maintenance of the vehicle, uh, is that something that is that's not covered already by the current exemption for repair? Fair. That's just a, a repair example. And, you know, I'll let um, Dan and Kyle jump in, too, in terms of the operational data. Um, but, you know, I do think there could be use cases where um, in the parent controls, you know, you could see as smart as vehicles are now that if you wanted to... Um, you know, tell the car to do certain things operationally. Um, actually, withdraw that. No, I think that um, Dan, if you've got an operational example where you would write um, to the car, please give it. But I can't think of one in terms of the straight repair and diagnostic context. Yeah, I, I you know, I think the situations where you would need to. Uh, delete or modify data would be limited. Um, I think, you know, the example that Kyle provided is a good one where, you know, maybe if there's a transfer of ownership or end of a lease, you would want to have the ability to delete your own personal data from the vehicle before it gets transferred to a third party. I think for the most part, you know, the use cases that we've envisioned are 
um, having being able to read that data, uh, potentially being able to reorganize it, process it in a new way. So if it's raw data you're accessing, you have some ability to process it. Um, and obviously to be able to share it with a third party of your choosing. Um, you know, I think also, you know, this, this, it gets into a second issue, which is, you know, does the copyright office need to sort of reach that question? Um, you know, our position is that this is data that is, that is owned by the consumer. Um, it's their data. They have a right to do with it what they wish within, you know, existing parameters for regulatory compliance and safety considerations. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that the Copyright Office needs to make a final determination about that unless, you know, to the extent that there's a greater safety concern with deleting data, then, you know, I think, you know, readability and being able to share are the two most sort of critical components, but I would defer to Kyle if he has other thoughts on that piece or if it can be cabined within, you know, certain specific use cases. All right, Mr. Weins. Yeah, there's two common uh, tools uh, that, that are pretty widely used. One is a tool called comma.ai, uh, and it is a, you, you get an Android phone and you put it on your dash and you actually augment the car with its uh, a, a open source self-driving feature. So maybe you didn't pay for it, your car didn't come with self-driving, but a lot of these cars these days are drive by wire. And so comma.ai is able to get in. And, and you can imagine how maybe the existing APIs they provide are sufficient to, to, uh, to perform that operation, maybe not. Um, and the closer that, that aftermarket mod can emulate the, the existing behavior, maybe it's you know, writing in the same kind of log information that the car would natively to the, to the telematic system, it would make sense. Um, another tool um, uh, that, that is, is a very helpful resource if you want to get a feeling of what kind of data people are using and what they're using it for is called AutoPy. And this particular tool plugs in via your OBD port. Uh, and then it's got its own telematics feed. So it's got a cell phone modem in it and it takes the data that it can read off the OBD port and it streams it to the cloud. And then you get a nice kind of fleet interface of everything that's going on with the car. Um, it's relatively limited in what it can access. So you can imagine that there's a lot more uh, telemetry and access inside the car than the AutoPi has, has natively. And they have a whole developer environment where you can build new apps on top of it. So I think you really have to think about the car as a general purpose computer that is the, that has all these transportation capabilities. What kinds of things would, would developers, would innovators like to be able to do? Now I realize you can't uh, 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 go as far as legalizing uh, trafficking in tools, but, but at least it, it can start to be the beginning of an ecosystem where people can start modding their own equipment. Um, it is very common in the racing world. If you talk to anyone like doing racing motorcycles, they buy an off the shelf standard stock motorcycle and then they make all their mods and modifications and everything to it. So there's a lot of situations where you'd say, well, no one would ever do that to their vehicle. Well, you start racing it and you're gonna make every possible change that, that you can imagine to the vehicle before you race it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna hold really quickly to see if anyone else wants to respond. I, and if Mr. Humphreys, if, if this is the chance, um, I will make sure to pause for you. Not quite there yet, thanks. All right, um, I will hand it back to Isaac. Yes, hello. We're hoping to move on from this question rather quickly, but the conversation so far and most of the filings focus very much on personal vehicles, uh, whereas the exemption uh, talks about both personal automobiles and commercial agricultural equipment and vessels. Do these types of vehicles collect different types of data? Are there ways to collect the data that are significantly different that we need to consider for these different types of vehicles? I can jump in. Uh, Mark, I see Mr. Humphrey wants to answer that one. I'll defer to him. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. I can't give you any insight into anything other than personal automobiles because I just wanted to make the point that auto innovators only deals with personal automobiles um, and, you know, doesn't want to be painted in the same brush as some of the other groups uh, who have in the past been much more restrictive about the data that's been available than the auto industry has. Mr. Jessa. Thanks. Um, so I think we've seen, at least in the agricultural vehicle context, that the you know very similar issues um, apply, um, and certainly you know there's been a lot of litigation in that area with uh, right to repair, 
um, for agricultural vehicles in particular. I don't think that there's, you know, major technological differences, although I think we've, yeah, I, I think that it's very similar. Uh, and I would just point out that the scope uh, of the proposed class seven mirrors the scope of the exemption for the existing uh, repair exemption. Mr. Weins. Yeah, conceptually farmers, yeah, it's the same type of information you can imagine you're building a soil density plot as you're tilling a field. That's very important information. So the equivalent of the, uh, the Pi app, I just told you there's one called farm mobile, uh, and it's the same thing. You plug it into the J, uh, the, the service port, the J 1309 port on the vehicle, and then it's got its own telematics feed and it feeds that data to the cloud. So that the farmer can have access because they don't natively have access to that information. Um, we could probably talk all day about the information that farmers care about that's on, on the tractors, but it is a very, very hot topic in the ag community. Mr. England? Good. Perking back to my uh, earlier remarks, it, it's still not clear to me that there is very much to this proposed exemption that is distinct from existing Exemption 13. But to the extent uh, that uh, this really does serve a distinct purpose, it seems like you need to base it on a record. And so... Uh, it's really notable uh, that uh, in the prior proceedings that uh, added agricultural vehicles and maritime vehicles, that uh, there was a real record about those things. And uh, uh, Mr. Ween's comments a moment ago about tractors were the, the first thing I've seen in the record of this proceeding that, uh, that addresses those vehicles. And so uh, if the purpose of this exemption is to allow parents to track new drivers, then somebody's got to talk about why that's important for boats and tractors as well as uh, for automobiles. And so I think this is uh, the, the question of uh, uh, what this purpose this exemption serves is very relevant to what vehicles it ought to cover. Thank you. I'll pass this over to my colleague, Melinda Curtin. Thank you. So now we're going to start asking some questions on non-infringing uses, and I will direct my next question to both the proponents and opponents. But I wanted to know, um, along the lines of what we were just talking about, is the fair use analysis different for the use of data from personal vehicles and vessels as compared to the commercial vehicles and vessels? And just to be clear, I'm not asking for a four-factor analysis. Mr. Jasner, you can go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I think that fundamentally, you know, with respect to, of, of, well, I would say at the outset, you know, there's always going to be a difference when you're talking about a commercial vehicle versus a personal vehicle. But I think that with respect to the fundamental issues that we're talking about here, they are they're basically the same, which is that the the data that we are talking about um, accessing, sharing. Uh, uh, using is data that is owned by the vehicle owner or lessee, whether that's a personal uh, vehicle or a commercial vehicle. In the commercial context, it's data that's owned by the fleet or by the fleet owner or by the independent operator of a heavy duty vehicle. And they have um, a right to use that data for lawful purposes to the, the fair use analysis has to focus, I think, in that case on what is what is the reason that we need access to the copyrighted components, if any, that are uh, integral to our access to the unprotected uh, data that is generated by the vehicle owner or lessee. So our use of our access to the, the copyrighted components of this are going to be minimal regardless of whether it's a personal vehicle or a commercial vehicle. And it's only as a means of either accessing, storing, sharing, or understanding the raw data that's been processed through the vehicle operation. So, you know, while there might be different use cases um, with respect to a commercial vehicle or a personal vehicle, the fair use questions have to focus on the minimal, I think, extent to which we're, we're implicating the copyrighted software in the vehicle in order to access that uncopyrighted data that is owned by the vehicle owner. Thank you. Mr. Greenstein. Thank you. I know you don't want a full four-factor analysis, but I think factor four is still very relevant here because 
there is no independent market for the data. The data is owned by the individual that owns the car and operates the car. Uh, to the extent that there is an affected market, it's a market that is not with respect to anything copyrightable. It's with respect to you know, repair or convoy services, for example, which don't have any relation to the market for the copyrighted work itself. They're really uh, additional services that are not related to the copyrighted data or to the software itself that is protecting them. Thank you. Mr. Humphrey. I would, with respect to fair use, all I would point out is some a point that we made <clears throat> in our opposition comment, which is that uh, many courts have explicitly treated fair use as independent of and inapplicable to an anti-circumvention limitation because they've noted that 1201 clearly and simply clarifies that the DMCA is supposed to target circumvention of digital walls around copyrighted material, as well as trafficking and circumvention tools. It doesn't concern itself with the use of those materials after the circumvention has occurred. And in particular, uh, courts have recognized that Congress did not intend fair use to be a defense to a Section 1201 claim because the purpose of the section is to prohibit even non-infringing circumvention and trafficking and circumvention devices. Oh. Thank you very much. And not seeing any other hands, I will pass it back to Mark Gray. Uh, great. Uh, my next question is for Mr. England, though um, certainly if anyone else wants to respond, please feel free. Um, in the joint creators comment for this class, uh, one of the things you mentioned was that in 2018, when the office had been looking at an exemption for telematics data, uh, we had found that there was, there was no showing of a likely non-infringing fair use. Um, and as you noted, part of that was because the, the class at the time was, was intermixed with access to telematics data, as well as um, some incidental access to entertainment systems. Uh, if we designed a, if we designed this class or narrowed this cat class in such a way that we were only dealing with operational telematics data, and there was no incursion onto entertainment systems, do your concerns about fair use still remain or are they just simply modified to some degree? So my client's principal uh, interest here uh, is served by uh, uh, preserving the limitations in uh, the current Exemption 13, uh, which is why they did not oppose uh, renewal of Exemption 13. So that is the uh, limitation for the purpose of uh, uh, getting access to other works and uh, the carve out for separate subscription services. So uh, you know, to the extent uh, uh, your question goes beyond that, I uh, think uh, uh, maybe Mr. Humphreys should address uh, the fair use analysis. I would just reiterate what I said, which is that we do not believe that fair use is a proper analysis under these circumstances based on what multiple courts have said over the years, including in the Universal City Studios cases in the early 2000s. Uh, to the extent we are going to talk about fair use, all I would point out is that, um, you know, the the broad and uh, I think unclear nature of what is being sought here in terms of the data has an effect on this because there are circumstances where even raw data, the selection and arrangement of that data could be copyrightable under the, for instance, uh, the Feist standard, but uh, we're just simply not sure what exactly is being sought here based on the exemption as it's written and uh, the information that's been given so far. I will say, I agree with Mr. England that I am starting to hear certain things for the first time here um, in this, uh, in these hearings today. So uh, this is evidence that hasn't been presented up until now. Uh, and like I said before, a lot of what I am hearing is, um, hypothetical, a lot of, um, statements that consumers should be able to do something, whether or not somebody agrees with that. I don't think that's within the spirit of what is required here. Uh, great. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Chini would like to ask a quick question. Mm -hmm. Yes, and just to follow up with some of the things that have been talked about a little bit already, we talked about three terms, access, store, and and share, and we're talking about non-infringing uses. I'm wondering if, and I'm hearing some of the conversation around this, is that how we're going to use this data is part of this non-infringing use conversation. Is, is the term, and it's not used in your current proposed exemption, would the term analysis be part of that? It seems like that that would be something that you're sort of leaning towards as use of this data once you gain access to it. Is that a 
term that might be helpful in potentially crafting an exemption here? Uh, feel free, Mr. Weens or others, to answer. I think that makes sense. It's certainly a lot of what you see. You know, you build dashboards to see what's going on. Yeah, I would agree. And part of that question would be then who would be doing the analysis, right? Because that's not been very clear we've, as we've tried to build out this record here and figure out what this what you're asking for. Who would be doing that analysis? Would it be the driver themselves or who would, who would they um, perhaps share it with? As part of your example or your language is using share, um, what, uh, who would be doing that analysis might be helpful here. Sorry, Mr. Jasno, I have you first on my screen. Thank you. Um, so I think that that analysis could be done by the consumer themselves, the owner or lessee of the vehicle. Um, it could be done by uh, an insurance company that is granted access to a particular vehicle's information by the owner or lessee. It could be a independent repair shop uh, who similarly is granted access by a specific owner or lessee and who says, you know, I would like you to keep track of, um, you know, certain uh, performance information about my vehicle so that we can optimize um, the uh, maintenance of the vehicle, which, and I do think that goes beyond just, we're not talking about the strict repair context. We're talking about a situation where, you know, the, the repair shop can say, hey, I see that it's likely this, this part is going to be need to be replaced in the next six months. I'm going to order that now so that this vehicle doesn't have to be in the shop for two weeks, um, which we do see as as uh, an additional benefit to the consumer that is above and beyond strict diagnosis, repair, or modification. It's something that allows really for optimization of the performance and um, maintenance of the vehicle. Um, so it could be any of those things. The way that we phrased it, I think, in our written materials is that it, um, the vehicle owner or lessee would be the one granting access. So it would be either that individual accessing and analyzing the data or somebody acting at their behalf. Thank you, Mr. Weans, please. I was quoting my car insurance this morning and they offered me a hundred dollar discount if I would install an app on my phone that gave them persistent location access so they could see when I'm driving. And I was just thinking the whole time, like, what a stupid way of doing this. Like, what if I'm in the car and Stacy's driving? Uh, my <laughs> I'm really gonna get dinged, right? Like they don't know. It's, it's a, like, obviously you would want to take the telematics data and you'd wanna uh, take that and, and, and feed it directly to them. So that's, I think that's a very good example of who would be doing this analysis of uh, fleet owners uh you know i have a business and i have a whole bunch of my employees driving and i want to see how they're driving what their performance is that that would make perfect sense so there's a lot of cases where you're going to be wanting to do that kind of analysis and so i think this points out if i if i may i'm trying to get from where you're going here is this analysis is more than just repair but it's overall not just diagnosis which kind of covers the previous but it's beyond that. And I think that's what you're trying to get at is what the difference is here. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that correct, correct. then? Yeah. I mean, it's all the, the, I mean, you have, where have I been? What have I been doing? What speeds? There's a lot of reasons that you would want to do that, that are not repair related. Thank you. All right. I think back to Isaac then. Yes. Thank you. Um, briefly, the current diagnosis and repair exemption uh, has specific language saying that um, the exemption doesn't provide a safe harbor or defense to liability under other laws, uh, including those promulgated by the Department of Transportation and the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, are the uh, opponents and proponents uh, comfortable with that language? Are there other laws that specifically need to be um, taken, laws or regulations that specifically need to be taken in, into account um, in the regulatory language? Mr. Chesno. Yeah, uh, MEMA would certainly support that identical language. Um, we noted that in one of our written sets of comments. Um, uh, so yeah, no objection. I don't think there are any other 
laws that need to be addressed. I would just point out that um, when the repair exemption was first passed, they did the Copyright Office did delay for a year or two years, I can't remember the implementation of it, to give other regulatory agencies an opportunity to comment. Uh, again, we'd have no objection to something like that, and that at least you know provides a fail safe uh, for other agencies to to you know identify potential issues. But I think you know we've been through a very similar process, and I think the existing language is probably probably sufficient. Ms. Fushay. Auto Care concurs with Mima on that point. And Mr. Humphrey. And I'll just reiterate again that um, Auto Innovators does not um, oppose renewal of the current exemption. Uh, excellent, thank you. Um, I believe that I will be passing this to Mark. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so in the comments for this class, uh, Mima mentioned that there are a number of different types of TPMs that restrict access to the ECUs in vehicles. Um, I think you provided some examples, challenge response mechanisms, encryption, disabled ports, circuitry. Um, as we're thinking about the, the scope of this class and commonalities within this class, um, how similar are the TPMs protecting vehicle data across different types of vehicles? Um, obviously, both the sort of personal commercial vehicle distinction we spoke about earlier, but just generally, you know, you know different specific vehicles, brands, et cetera. So uh, I can't speak in detail to different brands and what their you know different um, TPMs look like. There are there's significant variation uh, in terms of what mechanisms brands implement, and I think even across the same vehicles you might have different mechanisms. Um, you know there are, um, yeah I I think there's there's significant variation in that. Um, I don't know if Kyle, Kyle might have more experience with the, you know, the technical side of that. The specific question is how are they different between different vehicles? Are, are, are they similar or, or how similar or different are they across vehicles or vehicle categories? They're different. <laughs> it's because this is what's so frustrating about the, the this world is everyone decides they're going to invent some, uh, you know, uh, their own boutique system and and I mean often they have uh, vulnerabilities but yeah you have to develop a um, an exploit that's unique for each vehicle um, I mean for a while Volvo wasn't encrypting their ECUs so it was it didn't require circumvention and then they started doing it and, and you do and it depends on which version um, Mazda had a, um, a vulnerability that was easy to exploit and then at some point they patch it and then you have to develop a new a new exploit. So yeah, it's it's very different per vehicle. Tesla tends to be the most sophisticated of all of them. Uh, thank you. I believe um, Melinda is next. Sorry, Mr. Humphrey. Just briefly, uh, wanted to say again, you know, one of the points that we made in our opposition comment was that the TPMs are not specifically identified. The reference that uh, you mentioned about challenge response mechanisms and encryption, you know, those were references to prior triennial rulemakings and things that were discussed there. There's nothing identified now uh, as to what these TPMs would actually be. All we know is that they're seeking the ability to circumvent TPMs that restrict access. Uh, we don't know what the exact TPMs are. And Mr. England? And just to put a little more gloss on uh, Mr. Humphrey's comment a moment ago, it really is striking uh, when you go back and look at the records from 2015, 2018, and 2021, which I assume the office has, but uh, if you haven't, I really encourage it. There, there was a great deal of information about uh, the specific uh, TPMs that were involved and the extensions to uh, different classes of vehicles, all very richly supported. And here, uh, I think uh, uh, early uh, uh, in this panel, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Jasda said that uh, uh, it might be necessary to uh, uh, circumvent the TPMs on software to access the data. And I have heard somebody else say that a little uh, more recently. We don't really even understand what uh, what the need is. We don't have much of a record here on what the need is to circumvent TPMs on software to access data. And maybe it is uh, that uh, the software encrypts the data and you need to remove the TPMs on the software to decrypt the data. But we, we haven't heard that. Uh, 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 because the record uh, in this proceeding is really notably thin as compared to uh, prior proceedings that have addressed motor vehicles. 
Uh, great, thank you. I, I think um, actually I'm going to ask another quick uh, follow-up question, um, and this I think is generally for uh, Mr. England, Mr. Humphrey. Um, a, a, as we think about the, the scope of this exemption and maybe some of the you know intended or unintended consequences, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the concerns or sort of the the negative possible outcomes you have in mind and that you're concerned about if we granted a, an exemption of some sort for this class, Mr. Humphrey? Um. How much time do we have left? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, in, in, all, in all seriousness, um, I do have a few. Um, one of them that I will mention, uh, the uh, Government Accountability Office, Government Accountability Office, excuse me, recently uh, did a report on vehicle repair, I believe on March 21st. One of the things they found in that is that there are potential cybersecurity risks with sharing access to vehicle data, including telematics data. They gave examples of hackers being able to exploit vulnerabilities and systems to gain access to vehicle data. It includes location data and to control critical vehicle systems like steering. Uh, they also demonstrated that hackers could exploit vulnerabilities in a telematic system to compromise multiple vehicles simultaneously. Um, in addition to that, uh, I know that the FTC recently raised some issues about uh, the ability of uh, victims of domestic violence uh, to be tracked by some of these uh, technologies and the concerns that uh, the FTC had about automakers um, stopping that from happening. Uh, that's another potential issue with this. And also I mentioned earlier the idea of, you know, a broad exemption allowing access to certain things within these systems that could be protected as trade secrets, allowing that, allowing anybody potentially access to that. And um, I think another one that I would just point out, and it's, it's not really necessarily a negative, I would say, but, well, it is negative, but what I mean is, um, you know, these hearings are supposed to be um, focused on copyright concerns. And a lot of what we're hearing is about inefficiencies. It's about things costing more. It's about not being able to do what consumers think they should be able to do. Those aren't the sorts of issues that these proceedings are concerned with. And um, we see no reason to change or rather grant an exemption to the DMCA based on what we're hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. England. As I said earlier, my client's uh, most obvious and direct concerns are uh, with respect to their creative works, and those are addressed by uh, including a new exemption if you decide one is warranted, uh, uh, the same protective language for other works that uh, appears in current exemption 13. But uh, uh, they also do care about the integrity of the 1201 process. Uh, we think that uh, Section 1201 is very important to the protection of creative works, and uh, it is important that uh, there be robust protections for circumvention of uh, TPMs that are applied to copyrighted works. So uh, we do think it's important that uh, the office uh, rigorously apply the standards that uh, uh, have is developed over the course of the last eight proceedings to analysis of this proposed exemption. And so in that regard, yeah, we'll reiterate my concerns that it still isn't very clear to me that uh, this exemption serves a purpose that is meaningfully distinct from class 13 or current exemption 13, or that uh, the proponents have put forth the kind of record that has historically been necessary to justify an exemption. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Fache. Thank you. Just quickly, I wanted to point out, and I'm sure that um, you know folks have read the GAO study, but um, to the extent that those cybersecurity or issues were mentioned, those are existing issues um, from the automakers themselves, not from the aftermarket or from consumers trying to use or, um, you know, understand their vehicles through their operational data. Great. Thank you. Um, Isaac? Uh <clears throat> yeah, so uh, just on that point, there, there seems to be, you know, a lot of concern regarding safety and, and privacy with accessing data, um, but the Department of Justice uh, Antitrust Division and the FTC um, have stated that they haven't seen any additional data that supports the manufacturer's uh, safety and privacy justifications. Are you able to provide some concrete examples with regard to safety and privacy as it relates to accessing that data? Well, what I would say is that one of the issues that really strikes me here is um, if we're going to allow broad access to this data and allow users to potentially um, authorize others to use it, uh, there are concerns about personal data, I think, getting out there. If someone were to give it to um, certain companies, what, what what would happen to that data, how it would be used, um, that's definitely a concern. I think that one of the concerns that 
auto innovators and others have dealt with is that there are a lot of um, uh, laws that are trying to be passed in certain states that would grant access to personal data. Um, a lot of times they tend to be very focused, well, not very focused, they tend to really be about um, monetization of personal data. They, they cloak themselves in right to repair language, but um, in our experience, we've found that um, that is one of the things that is often sought by those. And there's a concern here that when you have a broad exemption like this, that uh, people who look to get that kind of data could potentially uh, hit the jackpot, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, so that that is that is certainly one concern that there is. Ms. Fouché. Yes, thank you. I just, um, in, in response to that, to Mr. Humphrey's comment, I mean, I think it, if I understand your comment right, it means that the, the auto manufacturers can monetize the personal data off the vehicles, which is what they're doing today, but that you're concerned that a consumer might use their own data to monetize it. Um, and that seems to have the paradigm backwards in terms of who should have control over where their data goes. Um, so I just make that point. I would just say that the concern really relates to what the consumer decides to give to a third party. Uh, Mr. Shaney from NTIA, do you have a question here? Yeah, thank you. I have uh, just a question, and this follows up with some of what we've been talking about, and this is a quote from the uh, FTC DOJ um, uh, uh, letter. TPMs can undermine research into vehicle operations, safety, driver behavior, and other valuable areas of inquiry. And I'm just folks' reaction um, to that as a um, as part of this conversation of of the sharing and use of this uh, data once it's accessed. What are folks' thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I just there, there's actually follows up with some points that I wanted to make earlier. Um, in that same GAO report, uh, some of the st statistics in there. Uh, stated that uh, some of the findings were that independent repair shops generally have access to what they need to make repairs. Um, the vast majority of the uh, repair stakeholders interviewed by the GAO said that um, they don't currently need telematics data for repairs. I would reiterate what I said earlier about the memorandum of understanding and the data sharing commitment. And uh, to uh, respond to one of Ms. Fauché's points that she made that I couldn't earlier, um, you know, if the, if the answer is that the MOU and the data sharing commitment need to be codified under federal law, I, I think the uh, auto industry doesn't have, or at least auto, auto innovators doesn't have an issue with that. Um, you know, the auto industry has gone out of its way to provide access to this sort of data. And again, I'll reiterate that the DOJ FTC report um, specifically says that the auto industry is uh, probably leading the way in this. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that um, we mentioned third-party apps and services that allow access to this data. I think it was kind of um, given the back of the hand, but I, I don't think it can be ignored that uh, these apps that we mentioned in our opposition comment, certain websites and, and things of that nature, tools that can be purchased, they allow access to this kind of data. It's out there. It can be acquired. And you know the, the, the lack of really addressing that in any of the written comments beyond in the reply, I think is just very telling. Ms. Fauché? Ms. Fauché, yeah. Oh, yes. I'll just point out a couple of factual things, and then I know we're running out of time. But um, the Auto Care Association recently released a survey that we conducted of independent shops that showed that nationwide, 84% of independent shops consider access to this data um, in this sphere, you know, their number one issue. And that half of the shops, inter, uh, over half of the shops who responded to the survey send up to five vehicles per month to dealerships because of vehicle data restrictions, because they can't fix them. Um, so I think I think that's um, that's the first point. And then, um, you know, we we'd be happy to continue to talk about the codification of the of you know, the, the MOU, that's obviously good news for us. Um, but I do think these are real issues that real people and real shops are dealing with. And the survey um, demonstrates that. We'll go to Mr. Jesno next, but I just want to tag that in the last five minutes, we are interested in hearing any broader thoughts uh, quickly about um, the alternatives that the various parties have introduced in their submissions. Mr. Jesno. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to uh, 
say in response to uh, Mr. Cheney's question about the research piece, uh, there is an existing exemption for uh, good faith security research that, you know, I think, uh, you know, some of what DOJ and FTC have identified would allow. Um, but I do think it's a really important point to emphasize that the FTC and DOJ have said on the record that they think this is a very valid exemption that is necessary to restore the balance uh, between the rights owners in this case and the rights of the owners and lessees who are ultimately the data owners uh, from the vehicle. Um, you know, that that is ultimately the core reason for these rulemakings. It's to ensure that these uh, TPMs do not create sort of a permanent lockbox uh, and, and prevent access to the public to make lawful non-infringing uses of copyrighted works. We're talking about here access to copyrighted works in the form of software, organized database schema that only allow for the user to um, make lawful use of their vehicle data. Uh, and I think what we're hearing from the auto innovators is that you know it's okay for it to be out there. It's okay for it to be available through third party uh, mobile applications, it's okay for it to be out there if it's through the MOU, but it's okay for it to be out there and shared if it's the OEMs who are sharing it through, you know, commercial agreements, but if it's giving access or lifting the threat of litigation against consumers, if they choose to share it with a third party of their choice at their own direction, that's where we're going to stop it. So I think, you know, that, that just doesn't pass, you know, I think basic uh, common sense, and it's it's uh, it it the copyright office has been, you know, delegated the authority to make sure that this balance remains um, stable between copyright owners and uh, the consumers, and I think this is a perfect uh, would be a perfect use of that authority. Thank you. I see a few more hands. Please keep your responses to around thirty seconds or less, and Mr. England. Yeah, I'd like to just briefly respond to uh, comment. Uh, uh, Ms. Fo, she made a moment ago, uh, uh, gave an example, I believe, of uh, uh, independent uh, repair operations referring uh, repairs to uh, uh, dealers because of an ability to access data. And uh, I think if anything qualifies for the current repair exemption, it is uh, uh, an independent dealer trying to repair. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Maybe it's an inability to rely on the current exemption, not due to legal reasons, but due to technological or capability reasons. But it uh, uh, seems like uh, uh, that's repair if anything is repair. And so isn't a reason to grant a uh, new exemption. Thank you, Mr. Weens. Part of the challenge there is we don't have the tools. Uh, so if you grant a tool uh, trafficking exemption, then, then then I think you'll see that challenge go away. Maybe we'll have to wait for Congress to do that one. Uh, if you look at the vehicle manufacturers, um, increasingly we're seeing more and more of these cars made, made in China. Uh, BYD is now the fastest growing electric uh, vehicle manufacturer in the world. Uh, and as a vehicle owner, I would be very concerned about, about my driving patterns, driving data going back to a Chinese manufacturer. So being able to like manage and control and, and delete, modify the data that I own on my vehicle where I may not trust the OEM is going to be an increasing uh, factor, I think. Uh, and and maybe, it's, maybe I'm in, in, in the U.S., maybe it's a car elsewhere, but this is certainly something that... Um, I think you're, you're going to see increasing concern about, do we really trust the OEM with the data? I certainly don't. Mr. Humphrey? I'd just like to point out that what Mr. Weens is raising is really a privacy issue, and it's not something that we should be concerned with here. These are, we're supposed to be concerned with copyright concerns. Uh, Mr. Greenstein, and then we're going to, and I'll pass to uh, Ms. Wilson. Right, thank you. Super briefly, um, what we're talking about here and what we are concerned with, and the Copyright Office knows this better than anybody, is we're concerned with non-infringing uses. And certainly to the extent we're talking about potential fair uses, we're talking about uses of data that is not copyrightable to begin with. To the extent we're talking about issues of privacy or safety or security, all of those things are non-infringing uses that are explicitly contemplated within the scope of this procedure. Thank you. I'll pass to Ms. Wilson. Uh, thank you so much. And 
I just want to thank everyone uh, who's been on any of the sessions so far. This has been uh, really, I think, a great 1201 set of hearings. And thank you for this group in particular, a very active discussion, which helps us. So we really appreciate it. I know that we have about five minutes before the public participation session. So I think we will probably be logging off to give everyone, uh, particularly on our side, a quick break. And then for anyone who has signed up for public participation, we'll be coming back. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for your patience with Zoom today. Um, right now, we're going to start our audience participation um, panel on um, our ninth triennial hearing. Uh, first up, we have Mr. Geiger from Hacking Policy Council. So, Mr. Geiger, um, I think our our host team is going to unmute you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Oh, ter terrific. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for holding this uh, this additional session and for uh, for setting all this up and for uh, working with me to overcome the technical issue to to join. Um, I'm uh, speaking on uh, class four. This is the uh, uh, generative AI uh, uh, exemption, so uh, trustworthiness research, and um, I'm going to speak particularly on uh, the the issue of fair use. Uh, so the exemption language that was recommended by the Hacking Policy Council uh, would reduce the chilling effect against good faith uh, AI trustworthiness research under section 1201 of the DMCA. Um, but I wanted to provide some more information for the record, which expands on the record regarding fair use that we provided on page four of the Hacking Policy Council's initial comments and page six of our reply comments. So the purpose of good faith AI trustworthiness research is to identify and correct algorithmic flaws that create potentially harmful effects, such as racial or gender bias, discrimination, copyright infringement, uh, synthetic intimate imagery, and other undesirable output. And the purpose of good faith AI trustworthiness research is not to infringe on copyright. And the exemption language proposed by the Hacking Policy Council would expressly restrict information derived from the research from being used or maintained in a manner that facilitates copyright infringement. So regarding the first fair use factor, the purpose and character of the use, uh, many of the activities involved in good faith AI trustworthiness research are highly transformative and do not merely supersede the objects of original creation. Uh, the research and the creative works produced by the research, such as um, uh, academic papers and discussions are of a wholly different nature than the AI systems that are subject to the research. So the purpose of AI trustworthiness research is not to replicate the copyright material, um, but to test, analyze, and improve the AI system's reliability and fairness. Uh, this transformational use shifts the original purpose of the copyrighted material towards a critical evaluative or, uh, evaluative or testing function that enhances our understanding of AI systems' societal impacts. And typically this type of research is conducted to facilitate uh, scientific dialogue, teaching, scholarship, and the advancement of computer science. So even if it is conducted uh, within commercial entities, the primary intent is to improve uh, safety and e efficacy, not to substitute the value of copyrighted works. Uh, second, the nature of the copyrighted work. Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work and AI trustworthiness testing involves code. Uh, so software that drives an algorithm, APIs that let AI interact with other software, and interfaces that enable users to provide input and receive output. So the proposed class focuses on functional code rather than expressive or imaginative work by researching the algorithmic output of computer programs. Uh, the third factor, uh, the amount and substantiality of the portion that is used. Um, when AI trustworthiness research may uh, access uh, significant portions of an AI system. It is for the purpose of ensuring rigorous testing and validation. Um, and these systems tend to be extremely large and complex. And so in most instances, it will not be necessary or even desirable to reproduce more than small or de minimis portions of the copyrighted AI system. Uh, good faith research is really interested only in access to the portions of the work that is necessary to demonstrate the validity of the research and uncover flaws that are in the public interest to address. 
uh, publication of AI trustworthiness research rarely contains substantial portion of the AI system code. Uh, fourth, uh, the effect of the use on the potential market or value of copyrighted work. Uh, good faith AI trustworthiness research does not replace the market for the original work, but complements it by identifying improvement uh, or trustworthiness risks. And so by enhancing the trustworthiness of AI systems, the research can indirectly increase the market appeal and user confidence in these products. And where AI trustworthiness research leads to corrections of algorithmic flaws, the value of the original work would ultimately be strengthened. Uh, we'd also note that, the, uh, that AI trustworthiness research tends to lead to the creation of many other protected works, such as presentations, new code uh, to uh, correct algorithmic flaws, um, and uh, academic papers, uh, just to name a few examples. So uh, in conclusion, uh, when evaluated under the framework, uh, sorry, the, uh, the fair use framework, good faith AI trustworthiness research strongly aligns with the principles of copyright exceptions designed to facilitate innovation and public benefit. Thank you. Do you have any questions? No questions during the session. Thank you, Mr. Geiger. Thank you. Mark? Uh, next, we'd like to have Mr. Willie Cade from Farm Action speak. Mr. Cade, I believe you're still on mute. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we're going to ask our team to unmute you. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Sorry. My name is Willie Cade. I'm from uh, Farm Action. Uh, senior policy advisor on the issue of right to repair. Um, I am speaking on behalf of farmers and not only the equipment that they use in the fields or in the barns, but also their commercial equipment that is so integrated into their systems for, um, for total production in their operations. Um, and clearly I believe that, uh, it is a, an important element uh, that we have not only the uh, already granted exemptions for agricultural right to repair of equipment, but also with the commercial equipment that's involved uh, in rural America, because oftentimes uh, getting a uh, authorized repair person out into a rural environment in time to meet the needs of harvest and or planting uh, is extremely difficult. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, next, we'd like to have Mr. Charles Crane from the National Association of Manufacturers, who I believe is also speaking about uh, class five, which is computer programs repair. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, as you just said, my name is Charles Crane. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Domestic Policy at the National Association of Manufacturers. Uh, the NAM represents 14,000 manufacturers of all sizes in every industrial sector and across all 50 states. Uh, I'm joining today to share the NAM's perspectives on both Class 5 and Class 7. Uh, so the basis of the, the so-called right to repair movement hinges on the false notion that owners do not have the ability to repair their own equipment. The truth, however, is that the majority of OEMs already provide a wide range of resources and tools that allow users and critically third-party repair businesses to maintain, diagnose, and repair products. In short, right to repair is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, which brings us to this specific rulemaking, uh, and, and the NAM's perspective is that the Copyright Office should reject the proposed Class 5 and Class 7 exemptions. These exemptions would undermine manufacturers' IP rights in service of right to repair, and the record does not support their adoption. First, both proposed exemptions are overbroad, poorly defined, and unclear about permitted uses. For class five, proponents actually concede that it's unusually broad in nature. Basic key terms in the proposed exemption are vague and overly broad, and they potentially implicate a wide range of products that operate very differently. Uh, proponents also claim commonality because the products in question are used for a quote, commercial purpose, but the mere fact of commercial use does not mean that all commercial devices operate in the same way, use the same TPMs, or have identical users or use cases. 
Uh, for class seven, on the other hand, uh, that would allow the circumvention of TPMs across a broad and abstract class that could include any lawfully acquired vehicle or vessel. Uh, this proposed exemption also did not specify the precise types of data that would be accessed or even what the terms in the proposal, vehicle operational data, diagnostic and telematics data, would precisely mean. Second, for both classes, class five and class seven, proponents have not supplied direct evidence about the specific TPMs that would be subject to the proposed exemptions, whether those TPMs are the same throughout each class or whether circumvention of those specific TPMs would allow for the proposed uses that are contemplated. Finally, proponents for both class five and class seven have failed to show that users will be adversely affected absent the ability to circumvent. Indeed, proponents have not even shown that the proposed uses and the circumvention that's allegedly necessary to access them are even desired by users. For class five, the examples are both de minimis and speculative and for class seven, uh, that proposal fails to include any specific examples of a user wanting to, but being unable to access store or share vehicle operational data. In the past, the Copyright Office has held that the totality of the rulemaking record must on balance reflect the need for an exemption. When the record offered by exemption proponents does not clearly define the proposed category or justify the need for an exemption, the Copyright Office has historically recommended against adoption. Here, it's clear that petitioners have not met that burden. The totality of the record does not support the adoption of the proposed exemptions in either Class 5 or Class 7. Further, granting these exemptions absent this necessary evidence or justification would undermine manufacturers' intellectual property rights in service of so-called right to repair, when in fact, as I've said, users already have access to the resources and tools necessary to conduct repairs and maintenance. Accordingly, the Copyright Office should recommend against adoption of both the Class 5 and Class 7 proposed exemptions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Crane. Um, finally, our final speaker for today is going to be Mr. Ken Austin, who is here to speak about Class 6B. Hello, testing one, two. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so just for context, I am the person who uh, submitted a, a request for an exemption regarding um, a uh, an additional uh, exemption for TPMs for video games. I'm not going to talk about that. I think that ship has probably sailed uh, for uh, for this year or for this uh, rulemaking process. But uh, I did watch all of these, you know, I'm new to this process. Uh, and I, uh, I just have a couple comments about things that I've, I saw today. Um, one is that Mr. Rothstein was talking about, uh, I think something called like final draft seven, um, some, some kind of word processing software, I guess. Um, and he seemed to suggest that, um, people shouldn't have access to version seven or shouldn't be able to buy version seven because 13 is for sale. Uh, and as far as I know, you know, in my layman's understanding of copyright, copyright doesn't guarantee sales of future iterations of a product um, and therefore access to uh, to an old version, even if it causes market harm to the current version of a product, isn't really relevant. Um, and so sort of uh, to that point. I, uh, I have about 10 years of experience in software and web development uh, for a hobbyist project. I um, I bought a copy of Borland C++ um, or Bor Borland Turbo C++ 3.0 on eBay. It's an old uh, compiler uh, that runs on MS-DOS. And um, the software is about 30 years old. It's not, not going to run on a modern computer. I installed it on an old, uh, on an old computer um, that natively runs MS-DOS. And with that software, I wrote the code for a small text adventure uh, video game uh, that will run on MS-DOS. Um, but under Mr. Rothstein's logic, it seems like, you know, if there was a Borland C++ 20, that I shouldn't have had access to 3.0 to be able to uh, engage in this, this project, um, which is not really something I, I agree with. Uh, and then uh, as far as something specific to, to video games, um, Mr. England mentioned when they were during the discussion about um, remote access, 
that a uh, a a button uh, a checkbox uh, even with human review wouldn't be sufficient to uh, verify the purpose of a use. Uh, yet uh, the I guess the constituents that he represents, you know, the rights holders, seem uh, to find a uh, a click of a button perfectly adequate to enforce a, an end user license agreement. Um, and indeed, uh, those license agreements can be enforced without the click of a button. Simply using the software could be a uh, a reason to enforce that license agreement. So it seems to me that the bar for what the click of a checkbox can accomplish uh, is quite high. Uh, so surely then the, uh, you know, clicking a button to affirm that, uh, you know, you're accessing something for a scholarly use uh, should be sufficient, especially with human review, because there's nobody looking over my shoulder when I agree to an end user license agreement for a game or whatever software I want to run. Um, and I, I, as far as any market harm uh, is concerned, I would suggest, I, you know, I don't know if this applies here, but if the best way for somebody to access uh, a piece of software is by jumping through the hoops of academia, uh, I guess I would argue that that is a, a market service problem, um, not a, a, uh, a legitimate concern for uh um not allowing um people to remotely access software for academic academic or scholarly use uh and then finally just uh there is uh, some talk about you know windowing as far as when what software is available um and uh i personally released a game on ios self-published it back in like 2011 and uh, that game is no longer for sale. Uh, I made like a few hundred dollars on it. Not a big deal. Not like a historically relevant game, but just as an example of a real world scenario here of why something might not be available uh, on the market. It, basically, uh, financially, it, it didn't make sense for me to continue to pay the fee to keep that game on the App Store, um, given the sales. Uh, additionally, there are compatibility issues with, uh, you know, as we know, operating systems are ever evolving. Uh, so uh, to make the game run on whatever the next version of iOS was, I would have had to do a bunch of work to update it. And I chose to discontinue support basically. Um, however, if I, even if I wanted to bring the game back, um, I'm not even sure I had the source code anymore. So uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, that that game will never be played again, most likely. Um, unless somebody is able to find it and circumvent surely some kind of TPM uh, in the uh, the package um, that's distributed as, as you know, the game executable, huh? what, whatever it is um, on iOS. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's everything that I, I really wanted to address here. Um, aside from just generally, I'm, I'm concerned about the state of, of technology in the United States. Um, it seems like copyright law is sort of, along with software licensing, is sort of being used as a bit of a Trojan horse to rob consumers of, you know, what was, I suppose, taken for granted as ownership uh, of their goods. Uh, you know, it used to be you would buy a printer and you could buy whatever ink that would fit fit in the, uh, the thing and use your printer. But now, you know, there's a, a, a TPM solution in the cartridge and or the printer or both. And um, that seems like uh, the road to digital dystopia, I guess, in my opinion. Uh, and with that, I think I'll, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to answer this question, but I, I wonder if, if there's a specific person at the office that I could contact um, to sort of ask questions about the process so that maybe, in three years, if I feel the the need for my proposed exemption still exists, you know, I could come in a little better prepared as somebody who's not an attorney or a CEO or anything like that. Great. Uh, thank you. So we, we do have a website with contact information and we have our public information and education office that uh, is able to answer questions like that. Um, the website for that, the URL is copyright.gov. Um, there should be a contact page, I think, um, fairly prominently displayed. 
Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Austin. Thank you very much, everyone else, um, all of our hearing panelists throughout the week who are here today with us. Uh, we really appreciate all of the time, the thoughts, the comments you provided. Uh, with this, our hearing is now closed. Um, thank you again very much for your valuable contributions. Um, it's been a wonderful week. Thank you.